being in a fire, it's actually quite calm. Um, you have all the hustle and bustle outside, hose being run out, people could be in distress, and you obviously have the visual of the building potentially being on fire and smoke coming out the windows. But as soon as you go into that building, uh, the smoke sort of masks a bit of the sound. It's, you can't really see much. You've got that fear of the unknown in front of you, and you can hear the crackling or the heat coming from the fire. So it's eerily or ironic, should I say, that it, it is quite calm. I just remember like obviously seeing someone's face when they're dead and, and you always remember their face and, and being in such close proximity and having to move someone around that's like just a dead weight and it, how floppy they are and all the different things like that. Um, I don't think you ever get used to. You never know, you know, next second, you know, the bells could go down, we could be faced with something different. Yeah, you know, you build very close bonds to people and um, you are reliant on one another for each other's lives. So yeah, it's a very strong bond. And outside the service, um, it's hard for people to understand and to empathise, but you, you, you do need to be like part of a family, you know, just to rub along day to day. But you know, also, the, you know, when it, things get tough, you've got to rely on each other. Some of the stuff we see is not a very nice thing to see um, and we have to learn to deal with that. I don't really tend to, when I go home, talk to anybody in my family about it. I wouldn't really go into detail about what happened or anything like that. I don't really want to have it to have an effect on them. called to uh, RTC uh, which come out on the turnout system and we get called to lots of RTCs sometimes they're something sometimes they're, they're nothing really as regards you know the magnitude of the incident for this one we were called to RTC involving two cars and this one guy was on the floor it didn't, it didn't look too too badly injured he was sort of he, he was sitting there if I remember rightly he was sitting on the verge as I approached the second vehicle, I could see that the occupants were um, injured, you know, quite severely injured. Once the paramedics had got in there, they had, were able to tell us that they had pronounced one of the passengers uh, dead at the scene, passed away. And this was a young guy, and the mother of the young guy was still in the driver's seat, still alive. Then we removed the roof of the vehicle, then we removed the casualty from the front seat, uh, and she was put into the ambulance. And then once we got the young chap out, we put him in, in his body bag, and the coroner came along and took him away. So to prepare yourself for that, you basically take on board all the information, process it, and then get on with your job. And it's quite a difficult thing to do sometimes. With that incident as well, we learned some stuff about the guy um, afterwards. And uh, so, you know, he was a very promising sort of lad, had a lot going for him in the sports sort of world and stuff like that. And that inf delayed information is quite impacting as well. We think about, you know, well, how was his mother gonna feel? at the scene, whether she was compass meant to send the ambulance, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's just a sense of great loss. But it's, it's just one of the things we, you know, we have to deal with. So, so. So there's a story that will always stick in my mind. I'd not been in the brigade very long, um, and I was initially stationed at Beaconsfield, and we got a call late afternoon to a dog versus a car. I'm a big animal lover, so I'm sat in the back of the fire engine with two other colleagues, and heart's racing at this point a little bit, knowing full well my sort of love for animals. And we get called to Burnham Beaches, which is like a wooded area near Beaconsfield, really popular dog walking area. Um, and we turn up and there's a car in the middle of the road and the owner of the dog we're assuming is being consoled by who we assume is the driver of the car, quite a way back from the car, so nowhere near where the dog is. 
Anyway, so I've jumped off the pump and been one of the smallest on the watch, uh, funnily enough. I um, go straight to the car to have a look at the, the scene. And I can't get my head right under the car, so I take my helmet off and I have a look under and there's this little spaniel um, wagging his tail. So not quite what I was expecting to see. So I've, I've held the dog um, under the car and stick my head out from under the car and shout to the owner, what's his name? And she says, oh, is he alive? Is he alive? We haven't looked. She says his name's Fidget. So I smile to myself thinking that's quite a funny name for a, a spaniel. And I shout to my colleagues on the pump, say, yeah, he's fine. We just need to um, lift the car up because what had happened was his ear was wrapped around the axle of the car. He was absolutely undamaged other than that. Um, the car had been luckily going very slowly, so he hadn't been dragged very far. And he wasn't physically impinged anywhere else under the car, literally just his ear. So we lift the car up with some airbags. I'm trying to hold him as still as possible, because if you've got your ear attached to something, that's going to be pretty sore if you move it. And as they lift the car up, he swivels round, and with this lets out an ex a, a screech that I will remember forever. Um, so I held him a bit tighter, and we unravel the wheel of the car. I pull the dog out, and he's completely unmarked. I mean, how, it, how he was unmarked, I'll never know. Um, and he greets his owner with a big waggy tail, and the vet takes one look at him. He's got quite a big ear, but other than that, he's absolutely fine. For something that we arrived to looking like it was going to be the worst, the owners were nowhere near him. Well, actually, it was a really quite a sweet outcome um, and uh, something that I will remember for the rest of my career. duty up in Milton Keynes and um, we got called to a flat fire. We were met by two ladies in uh, dressing gowns initially screaming uh, saying that their flat was on fire. Um, we pushed them to one side and, and calmed them down and made sure they were safe and they weren't going to go back in again and then we went forwards and um, made investigations on the flat. Um, they'd come out of this flat and locked the door so we couldn't gain entry easily. So looking through the letterbox, there was thick smoke, acrid smoke coming out. And looking around the side of the house, all you could see was black smoke in the windows. So it's pretty well um, smoke locked. Um, so as we enter the building, you have to go in low, you have to gas cool, because all these gases can ignite and just flash over and you've been incinerated. Um, initially, all sorts of things can feel like bodies when you can't see anything. There's like some sacks and stuff like that. Anyway, identified that you know, it wasn't something which needed rescuing. I made entrance to the first room on the right and um, I could just make out some flames in there. It's very hard because it's all black smoke. Um, at that point, I asked if I could vent the room to my entry control outside. Um, they gave me permission to do that, so I opened the bedroom window and let some of the gases out. And then at that time, also, we needed to take the fire loading out as well. So we started grabbing what was, couldn't really see it, but it's all bedding and sheets and um, all, all sort of personal effects. We started throwing it out the window. And of course, all the public were outside watching what was going on, and my colleagues. And um, what we didn't realize, we were throwing out all sorts of sex toys and things. So it was you know, a, bit, a bit embarrassing for the people outside, but suddenly they were faced with all these sort of, you know, exotic sex toys which uh, were right in, in the public eye. Um, once um, we were told on this when we obviously came out at the end of the job, uh, we continued on our search. The room was completely smoke logged and went further into the building to make sure there's no other um, source of fire within there. Um, and when we got into the front room, uh, the smoke started to clear and we could see then that there was like a, a pole in there for pole dancing. Um, so uh, we realised what we were in. When we come out, which looked like a respectable flat, it was actually a brothel. And these two girls were the ladies of the night. So it's um, just a little bit of a twist on, you know, sometimes we, you know, what, we, what we come up against and what we're searching for. You know, you see these TV programmes, I don't know, and they have the hero in the title. Um, I'm just going out and doing my job, just helping other people. I think hero, hero's a big word, and yes, we do help people in certain situations, and yes, we do have to cut people out of cars that may have deceased, or, but it, that's not, that's just doing my job, you know. In my mind, a hero is somebody saving somebody from cancer that, you know, is 
amazing in my eyes that we're just going out and using our knowledge and skills with the tools and doing our jobs so yeah I mean flip on its head and if you look at 9-11 and people died in the Twin Towers would you look at them as heroes after they've passed away maybe yes I think because they've taken the ultimate sacrifice but not initially I think we're just doing our jobs and doing what we signed up to do and it's because we want to do it so